Great to see your smiling face. You're supposed to smile now this morning here as we come to worship our Lord together. And uh, it certainly is a blessing. Now, understanding that the lights could be a problem this morning, I, I want you to uh, think of it if the lights go on and they become really bright, it means I'm trying to make a point, all right? <laughs> so you'll see that, you know, it's kind of like, oh, okay, it must be important, right? We'll try to time that this morning. I don't know how that'll work out. Uh, we are in the book of Mark this morning and chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, as we consider the parable this morning of the sower. So the parable of the sower, a very important parable according to the scriptures, one that we don't, um, we don't want to sleep on this one. We want to uh, pay close attention to it because it's vital that we're able to comprehend it. And you'll see what I mean by that. As we look here in Mark chapter 4, verse 1 tells us that Jesus began to teach again by the sea. I'm going to read for you the first several verses here of Mark chapter 4, and I'd like for you to stand with me, please, as I read God's Word. <clears throat> in verse 3, Jesus says, listen to this, behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road. And the birds came and ate it up. Other sea fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns came up and choked it. And it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil. And they grew up and increased, and they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray, shall we? Father, this morning we pray that our hearts would be open, that we would truly have ears, that we would hear, and that we would understand the significance of this great parable. Lord, help us, Father, today to uh, allow our, our hearts and minds to be shaped by the Word of God. Help us, Father, to come to your Word for the answers to life in all the various venues of life that we encounter. And help us, Lord, most importantly, to stop and consider the gospel of salvation. Help us, Father, to understand what Jesus is talking about so that we might be able to be encouraged by your Word today. Bless our time, Lord, I pray now in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, the title of the message this morning is The Difference is in the Dirt. And uh, what we're going to see here as Mark begins to develop the parable of the sower is that this is a very important uh, parable, and it's one that we really should give some attention to. Uh, as I look at it, we call it oftentimes the parable of the sower, but it really could be rephrased, and it could be understood really as the parable of the soils, because it's going to be the soils that make the difference. The difference truly is in the dirt. Jesus is going to turn his attention at this point in the book of Mark to teaching using the method of introducing parables. And I'm going to talk more about that next time because we want to talk about the significance of a parable, what Jesus was trying to accomplish by teaching with a parable, and then next uh, time we'll be going through several of these parables that Jesus is kind of rolling out before the disciples. I want you to see, though, before we go any further this morning, what it says there in verse 13. So Jesus gives us the parable down through verse 9, and we read the parable for the points that he's making, and then later we have the interpretation of it, and that's here in verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? And then he goes into explaining for us the parable of the sower. But don't miss that point. How will you understand all the parables is what Jesus is asking. If you don't understand this one parable, I'm not sure you're going to be capable of understanding all the other parables. And we look at our, our, our Mark chapter 4, we have the parable of the seed, the mustard seed. We have uh, all these parables start rolling out. How are we going to be able to grasp them if we miss this important one. 
So this is a critically important parable that we need to be able to grasp and understand. As we would understand it, Jesus is talking here, and there are certain things that are very significant. Uh, One of the aspects is the seed itself. The seed comes to be known as the Word of God. Seed can take a lot of different forms. Depends what you're trying to grow. How many of you are trying to grow something at home right now? All right. Several of you are. When you enter into the agricultural illustrations that Jesus is using, these were very simple things that the people could understand easily. But for you and I, we tend to grasp them differently because we don't oftentimes think in terms that are agricultural. Not that long ago, our society was mainly an agricultural society. That has changed a lot, hasn't it? Yeah. Just the fact that you're growing something at home. Uh, I'm growing something. I've got a huge crop. It, it's, it's green, and it, it needs to be mowed all the time. Um, yeah, and uh, you, no, you can't eat it. But, you know, you're always doing those things at, that are agricultural if you're back in Jesus' day. There's no one who's not working something uh, that's agricultural, maybe with the exception of uh, Levi, the tax collector, who had plenty of money and could buy his food. But most of them, this was uh, an illustration that they understood. The seed is representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we say gospel, we're talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. That is that he is the payment for our sins. He came and died in our place. And if we place our faith in him, we can have forgiveness of sin. We can have full redemption and we look forward to eternity in heaven. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And so this gospel is going to be sent out. If you stop and you think about how it used to be, This is a picture that goes uh, back a long way. Uh, This man is actually broadcasting seed. Before uh, broadcasting became associated with radio or TV, this is the word that was used in agricultural terms. This was an agricultural word. And TV and radio borrowed the word or stole the word, depending on how you look at it. Uh, But back in the day, you would have a bag over your shoulder filled with that seed that I mentioned, and you would grab a hold of it And you would disperse it by just throwing it out there where you wanted that seed to go. Now today, again, it's very, very, very different, isn't it? It's very different. I mean, you look at that field there. There's no doubt some big tractor that came rolling through there. And the tractor is cultivating the ground. The tractor has attachments that will actually place the seed at intervals. And so the seed is actually going right down into the cultivated ground. And it is something that is being done on a very large scale. So this is our understanding. When I think of farming, I think of John Deere tractors. I can't help it. That's just kind of what I think of. Uh, But in Jesus' day, there were no such things. So we understand that as we look at this, the significance of the seed is plain to see. But there's also a significance uh, here attached to the sower. Uh, This is a modern reenactment at high speed of a farm, uh, and the farmer is planting the seed. And that's a really fast, maybe a Ford tractor. I don't know. I think it was blue. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's one of those new Hollands. Anyway, uh, as you look at it, you see the, the significance of that. So once this all goes into the ground, you begin to see uh, that there are going to be reactions. Now, we're talking about the undiluted, unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what the seed represents. We're not talking about genetically modified anything. No GMOs here. Uh, We're talking about the truth. We're talking about the simplicity of the gospel. What I want you to see here as we look at this, there are different reactions. And this is where this parable uh, gives to us six reactions to the sower and his seed. And the first reaction uh, that you see here, notice there in, in verse 14, the sower sows the word, okay, the word. And these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. That is a corresponding aspect to 
the beginning of the teaching when Jesus said, some seed fell beside the road and the birds came and they ate it up. Now, as we use the illustration dealing with the message last Sunday of the Sabbath, We talked about the fact that there were pathways, there really weren't well-defined roads, but there were pathways that people would travel. And oftentimes these pathways um, were through the cornfields or the wheat fields or whatever they were growing, and they would go through that. And while they're walking, what happens if you continually walk on ground uh, people coming through, maybe some wagons, maybe animals? It's continually being hard packed. And it is so hard packed. And this is Jesus' point. As the sower is sowing, he may be throwing the grains in the field. Picture a field where you have a pathway that people are using as they go through t- from town to town. But there is on the, the sides of it fields. I'm trying to throw, uh, reaching into my bag. I've got a handful of seed and I'm throwing it out there. I want to get it fully aligned with my property. But there is this pathway. And inadvertently, some of the seed will fall on that really hard packed ground. And when it falls on that really hard packed ground, there's no way for the seed to get down in and begin to germinate and grow. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. So they heard it. But immediately, Satan is going to come along and he is going to take from them any consideration of this seed. So let's review just a little bit. In this illustration, who's the sower? Well, we might think of Jesus as being the sower, but we understand in light of all of Scripture that you and I are all sowers, right? We're all sowing the seed of the gospel. And the seed is very clearly the gospel that's being distributed. The soil types are indicative of the minds and hearts of people. So think of people as being types of soil. Some are not going to be open whatsoever to the good news of Jesus Christ. Satan, the Bible says, comes along and snatches away their hearing of the gospel. Their heart is not open to the word of God. Now, when you think of a heart, I want you to, this morning, stretch that out just a little bit, because I want you to think of a mind. I want you to think of a mind, because that's really what's going on here. We're talking about people who are absolutely, totally closed-minded to the gospel. And so you give them the gospel, and there's no consideration of it whatsoever. Satan has made sure that that ground is hard-packed. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And so there's no reception of the gospel. And so Satan is able to, to, to grab a hold of that. And that is the first reaction, which is basically no reaction at all. The second reaction here involves rocky ground. Notice with me here what Jesus has to say. In a similar way, and catch that if you would, beginning in verse 16. In a similar way, these are the open, or these are the ones on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy. They have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary then. When affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. This is the second reaction. Second reaction, the seed falls on ground, and it may be even ground that you would assume doesn't look too bad. Now, over in Israel, it's mostly rocky ground. It's mostly rocky. But the interesting thing is there, there were layers of limestone under the surface, and you wouldn't necessarily see that limestone when you were in there scratching around, preparing the ground to put the seed in. And what happens is this particular seed, this second reaction, the seed goes into the ground. 
But there's not much real topsoil there. There's not much dirt for it to grab a hold. And so because nothing is really happening where the plant, this is where you've got to think agriculturally, right? Most of the plant that you see, well, a lot of it that you see is under the ground. Would you agree with that? We're in big trouble if that huge tree out here is only 99% above the ground. Because it's not going to last very long. It's going to fall over and smash your car. Now, don't get excited if you park next to it. It's okay, because there's a lot of root system underneath the ground that you and I cannot see. When there is no opportunity for those roots to go down, the energy of the plant goes upward. And so you have something that springs up and looks great initially. What's the problem with that? Well, Jesus says here, when there's some difficulty, when there's some persecution, notice what he says. He goes very specific here with this teaching. And, and Mark is capturing this uh, more so than the other gospel writers. He is, he is really detailing everything that Jesus is saying. And he says, when they hear the word, they receive it with joy. That's the energy that goes up. They hear it, and there's a, a very positive reaction. But they don't have any firm roots in themselves. They are temporary because the affliction or the persecution arises. And notice how persecution and affliction is tied to because of the word. Do you see that there? Uh, right there in your text, it'll say because of the word. So affliction and persecution is not related to anything else. It's related directly to the word of God. So in other words, once they realize that this is uh, maybe something that they didn't expect as following Jesus, immediately the Bible says they fell away. It, was, it, was no, it took no time at all. Uh, when we were over in Israel, uh, I remember seeing a, a beautiful flower, and I remember being told, I took a picture of it. It's just a fabulous picture, I must say. Um, but, but this picture, the flower was purple, it was kind of rounded in its shape, it was really amazing. And I remember somebody saying, yes, take the picture now, because later on in the day, it will have withered. Because there was nothing for that root to go down into, to tap into any moisture. This is the second reaction. People hear that uh, Jesus died for them. And it's great news, and they're excited by that prospect. And it's like, well, okay, I can get my ticket punched and have eternal life. That's just fantastic. And there's an initial upswing of joy. But then all of a sudden they realize, as they are exposed to the word of God, that following Christ, there's a cost to this discipleship. And immediately when they realize that, they fall away. There's not a, a temporary dragging it out. They're just gone. This is one of the harder uh, aspects to accept because it's always so difficult when you see someone with an initial enthusiasm for the gospel. And yet I see it all the time. I stand up in Sunday mornings and preach to you all, and there have been people who have come through this church even in the four years that I've been here, and I see an uh, initial enthusiasm, but it's only temporary. And it's heartbreaking when people walk away. It's heartbreaking. This is because the soil is not good. There is a layer of rock underneath, and the roots don't go down in. The third type of dirt that's problematic and produces for us the third reaction uh, is the seed that falls on the ground, and the ground is already full of weeds. It's a, a problem for sure. And as this seed goes out from the sower, the seed falls down, it falls into that area uh, where they're trying to grow some crops, but it's not working out. And the seed falls on ground then that is uh, highly competitive. And these weeds want all of the nutrients in the soil. Uh, the weeds want the moisture. The weeds have their own root system, and the weeds are intent on holding on to that. That's terrible, isn't it? And what happens? But it doesn't produce, in the end, any fruit. The Bible says here, as we look at what Jesus is teaching, Jesus says, 
Others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. And you'll see there that they have heard it. He does not say that they've accepted it. He's not saying that they're people of faith. But he says the cares of the world or the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Interesting that Jesus puts riches in there, material things. And the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom the seed... and. It, and so you see here that there are these different reactions. The first reaction, it's hard-packed ground. The seed is just sitting there. The second reaction, we didn't see it at first maybe, but there's a layer of limestone. And so everything looked great at the first, but alas, the person has fallen away. The third type of seed goes upon the weeds, and he's saying here that it's the deceitfulness of this life and the riches that people might have. The desire, Jesus says, for other things. And so there's never any rootedness that takes hold there. I contrast that to the difference in Jesus' teaching when Jesus teaches things like if a man is out there in a field and he finds a treasure, he's willing to sell everything and buy that field because the treasure means everything. I think of the illustration of the parable Jesus uses of the pearl of great price. This pearl of great, great value is so significant that you would sell everything that you have and you would be acquiring that very valuable pearl. In all of these situations, it is Jesus who is everything. In other words, the person who is distracted and has heard the word and yet is in this sea of weeds is more enticed by the desire of the world than in following Jesus. You see, that's not how Jesus rolls discipleship out. Jesus rolls discipleship out in such a way that if Jesus is truly, truly precious, we'll follow him at all costs. There's nothing that's going to keep us from following Jesus. Nothing in this world matters more than Jesus. Are you here today and there are things that matter more to you than Jesus Christ? Oh, those are good questions to ask, aren't they? The fourth, fifth, and sixth reaction you're looking at the clock and saying, I don't know how he's going to get these last three in. I'll tell you how. Here you go. Seed falls on good ground. Now, I want you to notice the first fell on hard packed ground. The second seed fell on rocky ground. The third fell on weedy ground. But the fourth, fifth, and sixth all falls on what kind of ground? Good ground. And there is only one type of soil that bears fruit, and that is the good soil. None of the other soils are bearing any fruit, but this one here is going to bear 30 times greater than the seed that is sown. And some of it, number five, is going to bear 60 times more. And how about this one? Some are going to bear 100 times greater. Now, let me just give you a little bit of an agricultural lesson. If you plant one seed in Palestine, the ratio that it produces is eight times itself. Uh, so if you uh, put a little seed in and you say, oh, this is my nice uh, zucchini plant, how many zucchini do you get? About 150, right? I mean, it's such like... Now, all soils are different. Depending on the classification of the soil, based upon the nutrients and so forth that's in the soil, you'll get various rates of return on your seed. You with me? So in Palestine, one to eight was the normal ratio. And what Jesus is saying is that if you sow the seed of the gospel and it is falling on good ground the result will be 30 times more than the original seed that went into the ground, or 60 times more, or 100 times more. And in teaching this, the people were no doubt amazed as they sat there and they thought to themselves, how in the world are you going to get that type of rate of return? But this is the power of the gospel. Now, here's the thing. As we notice the first three reactions to the gospel. 
we notice those three types of soil. The difference is really in the dirt. And because that's true, the battle is also in the dirt. The battle's in the dirt. Satan is trying to close the minds of people around the world. Always has. He is doing everything he can to get that ground as hard-packed as possible so that when people hear the gospel, they're dismissive of it. He is working overtime to see that happen. You and I have witnessed this even in our own culture, haven't we? We are witnessing it in our own culture. What is the difference today uh, in 2018 than back when I was in seminary in 1982 when the preacher would preach a message, give an invitation, and 20 people would go forward? And we'd have a half a dozen baptisms every Sunday night. What is the difference You see, the difference is in the soil. Satan has gone over time working on the soil. And the soil is very hard packed. And what's not hard packed, we're going to see reactions where people are are thinking, hey, maybe it's a great idea for me to add Jesus to my repertoire. And they spring up quickly and then they realize, oh, Jesus wants all of me? He, He wants what? I need to serve him? I mean, you want me to read my what? Yeah. And they fall away. Others are looking at life. We have this huge problem in the United States. People are following the deceitfulness of riches, aren't they? Yes, it's great when the economy is rolling. But I'll tell you what, it takes people's minds away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they never develop in their rootedness. So there's a battle for the soil. There's a battle. We want good soil. How do we produce good soil? I would love to get in a strategy meeting with you right now. We have gone as a country from teaching kids how to read. You know how we used to teach kids how to read? We used to get them in the Bible. Can you imagine that? Public schools getting people in the Bible. Yeah, and their soil was good soil. So that when you told some young person that they needed to place their faith in Jesus Christ, they were apt to do so. And now they're going off as they go to secular universities. They're wondering, well, maybe there really isn't a God, and maybe the Bible really isn't God's Word. Satan is doing a great job hard packing the soil. And we just kind of go along with it as Christians. Oh, yeah, I guess that's true. There's only one soil type that bears any fruit at all. You can say whatever you want to say, and there's a lot of confusion, I think, on this parable because I think people, there's a lot of good preaching on this parable. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, there's great preaching on this. I mean, you can preach about the cares of the world and how Christians ought to, this isn't about Christians. This is about the gospel encountering the soil types. I could preach to you how terrible it is that the cares of this world is choking out. It's not applying to you. If you're here today and you've heard the gospel, and you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, as a follower of his now, what he wants you to do and what you are fully capable of doing is bearing fruit. And the fruit of the gospel will be seen. I am not discouraged by the fact that I live in a time where it's hard packed because I'm still echoing through my mind, Jesus said, look at the fields, they're brilliant, they're white, they're ready to harvest. People are still interested in the gospel. The day when the gospel no longer is making progress, I believe the trumpet will sound and the church will be called up into glory. But it hasn't happened yet, has it? There are still people who need Jesus Christ. You know why, when it came across my desk, this thing that I'd never heard of before, UW Sports Ministry, I thought to myself, hmm, maybe we won't just uh, write them back and say we're not interested. Because young people are going to come. We have about 80 young people almost, I guess, 70-some young people coming for UW Sports. And many, many of them are from the community. Uh, we have kids from foreign countries coming to this. We don't, we're looking for somebody to speak Spanish. Uh, they're outside the church. What are we trying to do? We want to see young people. I hope that next Sunday I can stand up here and tell you that there were salvation decisions made for Christ. I don't give a hoot about the sports. You know what I'm saying? And I love sports, but I don't give a hoot about the sports. I'm not doing it for sports. I could care less if they learn how to do something fancier than before. I'm interested in them hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and being saved. And in those who are not ready to be saved this coming week will at least hear the gospel. It will be presented by loving believers. And that truth you cannot wipe away. It is working the soil, isn't it? 
Ever run a rototiller? That is so much fun, isn't it? Yeah. If I had one, I'd invite you over this afternoon to run that thing. <laughs> There's just something great about a rototiller. It's, it's great, though, to see what a rototiller does, doesn't it? The idea is it cultivates, it mashes up all that hard dirt, it destroys that hard pack, and it gets it all fluffed up, and, and then it can receive the water so the water doesn't run off. That, that hard pack there, even when it rains, where's the water go? It doesn't go into the ground very well, does it? It runs off into other areas where it's much more able to, to grab a hold of that moisture. So you cultivate it, you rototiller it, and you get it all ready to receive the seed, and it's good ground. And there you can see the seed go in, and there you can see some wonderful results. Let us not be weary in well-doing, but let's be faithful in giving the gospel of Jesus Christ out. And let's be mindful from a point of strategy that our roles must be, it must involve a commitment to work in the soil. Don't miss that point. You work with kids, children's ministries here, you're working the soil. Is it valuable? You better believe it's valuable. You're reading kids' books about Jesus. You're teaching lessons. You're working the soil. You're talking to your own children who might be in high school. You're working that soil. You and I want to work the soil so that the heart and mind of young people and older people, every people, our neighbors, our friends, that we're opening their hearts to receive the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, these are the reactions that you're going to find. And I find that the teaching here is so relevant. It is as relevant in 2018 as it was when Jesus stood there by the seashore and taught the multitudes. It is the same reaction that I've seen for 30-some years of ministry. Good soil will finally produce good crops that will demonstrate the faithfulness of Christ's gospel. Some things to think about. Jesus makes the point that if you can't understand this parable, you're not going to understand the other ones. Why does he make that point? He makes that point because either you're spiritually walking with the Lord and able to discern those things which are spiritual or you're not going to be able to. And if you cannot, you won't understand this parable, you won't understand any of the parables. The difference is truly in the dirt. It's about the heart. It's about being a follower of Christ. And a very important question you need to ask yourself is, how did I respond to the gospel when I heard it? Maybe you're here this morning and you've yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Is your hard heart? Is your heart hardened? Is the, the rocky soil underneath giving way to a, an initial burst but nothing follows? The cares of this world have cut it off. Or are you here today having placed your faith in Christ and now you can see that the endeavors in your life are bearing fruit? If you're not seeing fruit as a Christian, let me encourage us all to sow the seed of the gospel and be faithful in doing that. Satan wants us to get discouraged. You know, sometimes when you go fishing, you don't catch any fish. That's just the way it is. But at least you put some bait in the water and fed something. You and I need to get the gospel out. And we need to do that knowing that it is up to God to produce the fruit. He's called on us to sow the seed, but there's not one of us that can make it grow, but he can. Let's bow our heads and pray together. May we just take a moment to stop and think about the significance of this parable. If you're not here, to, if you're here today and you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity, how important it is to make that determination. We have folks at the front who would love to pray with you. If God is speaking to your heart today, would you all stand with me, please, as we have a word of prayer? Father, heaven, we thank you for the love that you've shown to us, Lord, the patience that you've shown to us. God, you are a God who is truly rich in mercy. Help your followers, Lord. Help all of us to be committed to sowing the seed. Help us, Father, to be patient and waiting for the harvest. And Lord, help us, Father, to honor you 
in our service. Bless those, Lord, who may be here today who are not sure what type of soil their heart reflects. But, Father, they're interested. May they truly come to the gospel and find salvation here today. I pray this all now in Christ's precious name and for his glory. Amen.